we've gone through this process, and we know that not only are these big customers, but also these are big customers who generate huge amounts of revenue for us. Or, and this is a big or, or they have the potential to generate huge amount of revenue for us. So these customers that we're talking about, typically they're big, complex, global companies. We need astute skills around navigation and business management, okay? And in these customers, these key strategic accounts, we're going to be working with a large, potentially dispersed customer team. So, you know, this is not a solo sales rep calling on a large company. This is a team-on-team -team event. So we're going to have to bring our account team, our A team to this. And we're going to bring some very impressive resources of our own to managing these strategic accounts. Now, still setting the table for this, right, we're talking about these very complex customers. And we're talking about engaging with them strategically on a multi-year basis, right? So it takes the right kind of a person to manage that relationship. So we're not talking about a territory sales rep at this point, right? No disrespect to them, but we're not talking about managing 20, 30, 40, or 50 accounts and then trying to figure out which one I should spend my time on. We're truly talking about those special people who have that that strategic engagement capability, right? Because if you try to tell us, you know, a anybody, frankly, that you need to strategically engage with 20, 30, 40, or 50 companies, you know, their heads are going to explode, right? It's going to be impossible for them to do that. Just the amount of time, effort, and diligence to be perceived as a trusted partner is something you really can't accomplish for more than perhaps a handful of accounts. And this is borne out by some research from the Strategic Account Management Association. So every two years, they go out and do a survey on current trends in strategic accounts. And as you'll see, you know, on average, a strategic account manager is managing one to three accounts. Okay? These are people who are going to be driving significant sums of revenue from these globally complex customers. So that's kind of the what's in it for me. And the why do I care part of that is part of it's driven by what the customers are doing to us. So for the last couple of decades, the procurement teams have been working really hard to whittle down the number of companies that they do business with. There's a specific metric or bonus that the procurement people are paid based upon reducing the number of companies that account for 80% of a company's total spend. So they're out there trying to reduce that number. So you certainly want to be part of that golden few capturing that lion's share of revenue from your customers. Now on the flip side of that, from that same SAMA research, we're comparing the gray bars, which is year-over-year -year revenue growth for non-strategically managed accounts, with the green bars, which are, is the year-over-year -year revenue growth from those strategically managed accounts. So you'll notice the growth rates of the green bars of the strategic accounts is significantly higher. So the fact that, A, these are our biggest customers probably, and the revenue is growing faster from them, that has huge impact to both the top and bottom line for our company. In fact, if you look at the averages, your strategic accounts revenue grows 80% faster than non-strategic accounts. That's a pretty big what's in it for me. So... Now let's talk about how important is segmentation and what are some of the approaches to it. So first off, let's take a look at the world-class benchmark from the Strategic Account Management Association from SAMA. And you'll notice that the number two item on their world-class attributes of strategic account management or global account management organizations is how well that company does segmentation and prioritization of their customers. So it's crucial. This is a top, top element of that entire process. So what are the traditional or common approaches to this? Well, first, the easiest way, the most common way that people do this, and I'm not putting this down, I'm just telling you flat this is the most common way, is you dump every single customer you've got into an Excel spreadsheet with the amount of revenue that they generate for you over in one column, 
and then you stack rank them. You sort them in decreasing order based upon revenue. So this is a sample stack ranking that we did for a customer, you know, a $500 million company, you know, with a few thousand customers. And, you know, even our, for them, their largest customers, those at the top of the Excel spreadsheet, generate huge percentages of revenue. Now, when you move up the scale into something like a Fortune 500 company, where they've got tens of thousands of customers and billions of dollars of revenue, you still get the same effect. Now, you don't get quite as high percentages of total customer revenue, which is what that column is over on the right-hand side, but it's still, you know, when you're talking 20, 30, 40 million dollars or more per year from a customer, that's a lot of revenue. We want to make sure that we keep that in mind, and frankly, we want to make sure that that number is growing fast, because there's other competitors of ours that are looking at those numbers very hungrily. So what this results in is if you just do a simple stack ranking, you end up with basically what might look like a pyramid. So here's a sample customer. 25, this customer of ours has 2,500 customers, 400 million in revenue. And a common thing that we look at is what is that overall? And what you'll notice in general across all industries is that top 20% of your customers generates 50 to 80% of your revenue. That is an awful big percentage of our overall revenue. We significantly want to impact that. So one of the simple things that we can do is just draw a line in that Excel spreadsheet that we did, right? We can draw a line that says, let's look at the top 5%. So if they have 2,500 customers, 5% of those is 125 customers. So the top 5%. And we'll look at some of the numbers. And in this case, it was 56% of revenue, right? a total of $225 million. That 125th customer generated $325,000 a year in revenue for this company. But if you look at the average, the average in that top 5% was $1.7 million. So there's a pretty heavy curve here as you move up towards those top, top customers. So this is a typical approach. You draw that line at, say, 5%. Right? And then every account above that is declared to be a strategic account. Why? Because they're generating a boatload of your revenue. Something really, really important. So, not a bad approach. It's just very common at this point. But, let's take a look at what better might look like. So instead, and what you're looking at right here is, is a a Gartner 2x2 grid, and this is actually generated from the Revigy software here, a customer portfolio segmentation view. And what you're looking at is two axes. So across the bottom, we're looking at the current value of this customer, meaning how much revenue do they generate for us. So from left to right across the bottom of the screen, we're looking from generates very little revenue to the far right generates a whole bunch of revenue. And to that, we're going to add one more dimension. We're going to look at what's the potential value of this customer, right? So we see those customers of ours in the bottom right corner, Caterpillar, Chesapeake, Lone Star, Tampa Electric. Gosh, love those guys. Fabulous customers of ours. Fabulous, fabulous, love them. Generate a lot of revenue. The problem is they're tapped out, right? We've got as much wallet share in those accounts as is possible. Or maybe they've got, if it's a software world, they've got an unlimited license agreement where it's all you can eat from us for a fixed fee over a period of time, right? So that happens sometimes in software services companies where you've capped the total amount of revenue. It's a lot of revenue, but there's no incremental potential. So would you really be focusing on those bottom right customers? Probably not. If you look at current value versus potential value, you're probably going to focus there up in the top portion of this. That's a better way of looking at this. So if we're going to look at those top customers, what kinds of criteria might we use? We might look at wallet share or white space analysis, you know, market information, how fast is the company and their market growing? Are they a leader in their market, right? So sometimes in specific market segments, when the leader buys, everybody else buys. So that's a great company to have as a customer. And then one of the leading concepts that people are starting to look at is what's the lifetime value? So over a realistic lifetime, whatever it is for your industry, but a common lifetime value to anticipate is seven years, 
what's the value of this customer over the next seven years? Now, interestingly enough, I've worked with companies where they've had customers for 20, 30, 40 years. Think of the lifetime value of some of those accounts. So this is, a, I would say, a better approach. Now, let's look at what's most common in this kind of approach. Now, you're always going to see revenue in this mix, right? So this, we're once again leveraging the most current trends survey from SAMA, okay? And this is a, a better approach, and these are stack ranked the most commonly used attributes in the strategic account world for segmenting your accounts, right? Stack ranked by what's the most commonly used. So now we're moving away from just a solo look at the revenue to us. If we look at some of these attributes, we're starting to look at those that also start to look at this from the customer's perspective. There's a key thing, right? Not just things like market leadership, but strategic fit, right? Buying behavior, trust and relationship. Really interesting comments. Maybe you can't actually measure them statistically, but you might be able to come up with a reasonable attribution or value for those categories. So these are the common attributes. And then now, let's take a look at that. If that was we did good was just stack ranking by revenue. If better was starting to look at some other attributes which involve the customer, let's take a look at what best might look like. Okay? We still have revenue in the mix because we're all in business. We're not not for profits. We're trying to make a little money here. So we're all in business trying to make money. And from SAMA, the top four proven most important attributes in terms of looking at your strategic accounts are the four you see on this screen. How rapidly is their business growing? You know, good fit culturally and strategically with us, back to trust. So like I said, revenue always shows up because we're, we're not not-for-profit. Now, these are the most common across the SAMA survey uh, audience. Now, I'm not saying that these are the right ones for you, right? So your mileage may vary. But what we are going to look for is Things like these and some additional, right? So one of the ones in here that's crucial is strategic fit. What does that mean? So we're going to take a look at what strategic fit means here in just a second and try and bring that all together. Now, to do that, to kind of talk about what a strategic fit mean, I'm going to go back to our 70s television concept. So I remember, because I'm old, a television that looks like this. Knob on the top, which was the, you know, VHF, and the knob on the bottom, which was the UHF. So on the top dial, we had ABC, CBS, NBC, and on the bottom, we had those independent stations. And I really disliked that button, that switch on the bottom, because you rotate the dial, there's like 80 numbers, but there were only two stations there. It drove me nuts. But anyway, so back then, ABC, NBC, CBS, generic television, broadcasting a wide variety of programs, to the widest possible audience, right? Today's version of spam. And then we saw some of the independents coming into this, independent television stations who are building a brand and start focusing on just a narrow market segment. They wanted to serve a specific segment. You had TBS bringing back reruns of Gunsmoke and all those, the Rifleman and all those great, I was a big Western fan if you can't tell, right? All those great television shows. You had CNN for the news junkies. So they started to appeal to a specific audience. They garnered significant revenue growth because they were focusing on a specific market. And then we have the advent of the cable box and, you know, moving from dozens or so to hundreds to even into the thousands if you've got satellite or cable television today, thousands of stations. Now, in the transition from the 1970s to now, that, you know, call it 40 years, there has not been a growth in population in the United States of thousands of percent, even though we've had thousand percent growth in channels. What we've done is we've carved and carved and carved so that TBS and the Discovery Channel and Arts and Entertainment and Comedy Central and Sci-Fi Channel are focused on people who really care about those channels and will pay because what they're serving up, that customer really wants. And so that's kind of the crux of what we're looking to get to here when we start talking about strategic fit and strength of relationship. So some of the attributes that we want to bring to the table here 
as we look at this strategic fit model, right, is is this one of our ideal target market segments? You know, you know, if you talk about partnership, I'm always reminded of Walmart back in the 80s where, you know, you could be partnering with them all you wanted, but all they really cared about was who was going to give them the lowest price. And then you want to look at some of these other attributes, right? One of the strongest ones is relationship. What kind of relationships do we have and can we leverage? And I'm a big fan of loyalty, not satisfaction, right? I don't necessarily believe in, in customer satisfaction. Co satisfied customers leave in droves. Loyal customers stick around. So looking at some of these other attributes is crucial in identifying you know, what are those best fit customers of ours. And once again, just a snapshot out of Revigy where we're applying some of these metrics and segmenting our accounts. And focusing, say, on those accounts that have, in this case, the best relationship and fit, as well as the highest potential value. And those are the accounts that we really want to focus on. Those are our primary accounts that are ripe for harvesting. And so what's the journey to effective segmentation look like? What's the process that we're going to go through? So I put these in priority order in addition to the steps you go through. First, figure out what does your ideal customer look like? Get your SAMs, get your management team together, brainstorm what do you think are, A, your best, most important strategic accounts, and then why? What are the quantitative and qualitative metrics, attributes, or measurements of those that make them ideal customers. And then go through a process to score your accounts, score those top accounts. So you want to make sure that you're doing a, a, a good job here. You've got both quantitative, qualitative numbers, and then do some math. You know, Go through and do some regression testing to see which of the attributes that you brainstormed actually truly have a high correlation. Because what you're looking for is if you're just looking at the top of the pyramid and those companies that have the most revenue, what about the jewels that are buried down there at the bottom of the list? You don't have a lot of revenue from them today, but man, they fit your ideal profile. You've got some relationships to leverage, and oh, by the way, there's huge potential for you, right? So I've seen companies where General Electric, they got trivial amounts of revenue from General Electric. It was way at the bottom, but Given what they sold, GE should have been at the top of the list, even though they were down you know, at the bottom of the list in the current revenue. And then one of the big things that we started to talk about is what's that lifetime value of the account? What relationships can we leverage? How hard is it going to be to displace the competition? If it's truly one of your ideal customers and you've got good relationships, form that beachhead. Remember, strategic accounts are not formed overnight. It's a collaborative process where the customer has to perceive you as a partner and you have to perceive them as a partner. So you don't do it overnight. It's a journey. It takes time. Right? So where do we then, after we've gone through those attributes and that analysis, then draw the line. Pick a spot, draw the line. Not forever. We need to reevaluate this on an annual basis. And focus on those above the line. Additionally, even the accounts above the line, you still want to tier them. Right? So you've picked these 50 accounts as strategic accounts, for instance. Which ones get one strategic account manager? Which accounts get three or five strategic account managers? You know, back in the 1980s, I covered Bank of America. At that time, I want to say Bank of America was generating about a billion dollars a year for IBM. IBM had five strategic account managers in each different pillar or total, one in each of the different pillars of the bank. So they had a five-to-one ratio of strategic account managers to one account. So where do you draw the line and what resources do you allocate to that? You know, the reason being is even amongst those that you choose as strategic accounts, there's going to be wide variability into what that revenue curve looks like and how much revenue because your top accounts generate that disproportionate amount of revenue in your world. All right. And by the way, I am uh, giving you fair notice that we've got about eight minutes left, so about three minutes from now I'm going to wrap this up and go to questions. So just uh, as we talked about tiering strategic accounts, 
right? You want to make sure that you do effectively tier those accounts, and you are probably going to attack them differently, right? Different staffing and resources. You might have your executives focused on different ones, and internal expectations around revenue and margin may also be different. All right, so to accelerate through this and look at the last bit of this, what does good look like, right? What's the value of better segmentation? Well, first and foremost, it's moving up the pyramid to becoming trusted advisor. Look at the win rates and the percentage of account managers making quota when you've reached level five trusted partner status, right? Additionally, we have a customer who went through a journey, built up the strategic accounts, identified their top 75 largest customers, and in a mere, mere period of two years, their net promoter scores, which is a measure of loyalty, went from negative to positive. That's a huge leap in a two-year journey. Additionally, from CSO Insights, there's a couple of metrics we really want to impact. <coughs> Excuse me. We want to make sure that we do a great job getting revenue from additional sources, additional business units, regions, and geographies within our customers. Not something that's traditionally done today in a lot of accounts. Additionally, those strategic accounts, if we choose them wisely, they're going to be great places for us when we introduce new products where we're going to bring those new products in. And then lastly, we're going to take a look at, okay, what is that value proposition? How valuable is that? So remember, 80% higher revenue growth. So if you remember those curves, those revenue curves that we were looking at, huge, huge revenue improvements for the largest, largest customers if we truly choose the right strategic accounts and manage them effectively. <coughs> All right, so the first question that we've got here is how does this vary for the Latin American market? So Carlos, thank you for asking that question. So the same thing applies. If you look around the world, <coughs> The strategic accounts in the United States, a lot of global companies based in the United States, Bank of America and GE, those are enormous companies. <clears throat> but then when you move down into Latin America, even though the size of those companies is not as large as a GE, if you start talking about, you know, a Telefonica or a Bimbo or a <clears throat> Femex or any of those companies, <clears throat> They're extremely large organizations. They still need to be managed in a strategic fashion, and you still need to tier those customers and apply the same metrics of what's a good fit for us and where's the most potential. So not just the biggest companies and those that generate the biggest revenue, but those that have the best fit for the solutions that we provide. Now, <clears throat> All right, I'm going to give you another 30 seconds while we look for just one more question, and then we're going to wrap things up because we've got, it looks like somewhere around the neighborhood of 60 seconds left before we turn into a pumpkin here. So <clears throat> one of the common questions we get from people is, well, we've got this very, very large customer or group of customers that generate an enormous amount of revenue, and they, they don't treat us like a strategic partner. You know, because they generate such a huge amount of revenue, shouldn't they be on our strategic account list? Well, the big challenge is, you know, if you just declare a customer to be a strategic account because they're big or they generate a lot of revenue, that's not a mutual or a collaborative proclamation. What you're really looking for on this journey is that companies or, or customers that will go on the multi-year journey to strategic collaboration together with you, right? It's something you do with them as opposed to something you do to them. Just running up to a customer and say, hey, we've declared you to be strategic. Aren't you excited? Doesn't really buy you anything. That's usually the point where the customer looks you straight in the eye and says, good, we need bigger discounts. So that's not the approach you want to take. You want to look for that willingness to partnership and that willingness to partner and that top fit. All right, folks, that's it. We've now hit the end of our uh, webinar, 30 minutes, and uh, I'm – Hopeful that you got some good information about this. We will take this particular webinar, we'll box it up, we'll send a link out to everybody, we'll post the slides out to SlideShare, and we'll send out an email to everybody attending as well. 
making you aware of our next webinar, which is, uh, I believe, going to be in June, so you'll get notified for that. Thanks. Everybody have a great day.